Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Pastor Kim Yong, for your beautiful introduction. And um, well, I am actually very, very excited and uh, delighted to be sharing God's Word with all of you. Um, because for the simple reason that I believe and I witness that God's Word can become alive in your life. All right? right here in Church of Our Saviour. In fact, yesterday, I saw it happen. I saw God's Word come alive. Well, yesterday morning, I was preaching at the Hokkien and dialect service. You know, I, this is the third time I'm, I'm saying this, uh, and uh, I'm still finding it interesting and amazing. So I was preaching at the Hokkien and Cantonese service, and I was preaching on the topic, how to edify one another, or edification with one another with uncomfortable words, receiving and giving uncomfortable words. So right after the service, I walked out of the auditorium, a lady, an auntie, all right, came to me, wrapped her arms around my elbow, put her palms on my face, and sayang me gently, <laughs> looked me in the eye, and says, Pastor, your Hokkien is lousy. <laughs> Uncomfortable words for edification. I take it, and I will improve. All right? And I hope that today's message will be, the true, will be true as well. Not that my English language is no good. Lah. Just that I pray and I hope that God's Word can come alive in your life. Amen? Amen. Well, today I'll be preaching on the topic, being extraordinarily. You see, um, allow me to further introduce myself. I mean, Pastor Kim Yong has introduced myself, and I think uh, I should introduce myself further because this is my first time here, and probably I think you should know me better. As you can see, I am a Chinese. All right? I am very Chinese. I, uh, I'm born into a Chinese family. I grew up speaking Chinese to my family members, and in fact, my friends, we grew up speaking Chinese. And then, as I grew up, uh, at the age of 13, I enrolled myself to a very good Chinese SEP school. You hear the name, you know it's very good. Anglican High School. Very good, all right? I'll send your children there. Okay, Anglican High School, Chinese SEP school. And I graduated, I accepted Christ because there's a chaplaincy work there. I accepted Christ there and I joined the Chinese church, singing praises in Chinese, hearing sermon in Chinese. And then after my university, I graduated. God calls me to serve in this Chinese church as a youth worker. Okay, three years later, God calls me to go for equipping. I studied in a beautiful college, wonderful college called Trinity Theological College. But I enrolled myself into the Chinese department. So I have to listen to lectures in Chinese, write papers in Chinese. That's tough, very tough. Okay, but I'm Chinese. Okay, so after graduating, I went back to All Saints Church uh, as a pastor, preaching Chinese message and also ministering to the Chinese congregation. I married uh, my wife. She's a director, a producer. She produced and directs uh, programs for Channel 8, Channel U. Very Chinese, okay? And uh, we, had, we have a girl. Uh, she's seven months old this, uh, today. And um, she, 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 her English name is basically her Chinese name being Romanized. So very Chinese again. And we, we have a dog. So a dog, uh, the dog, the name is Su. So no English name, just Chinese name. And uh, we, 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 we speak to the dog in Chinese. Yeah. So, uh, and right now, I'm preaching to all of you in English. Okay. Because I believe that I want to go extra for all of you guys. I'm convinced, I'm convicted by the Spirit of God to go extra, to use a language I'm not familiar with in this platform to share God's word with you. In fact, fun fact, the last time I preached in English is this morning. No, it's <laughs> before yesterday, before yesterday, the last time I preached in English is in January. And I preached a five-minute sermon only. And today, I'm going to preach 30 plus minutes with English because the Lord convicts, convinced me and convict me to go extra for you. You see, um, as inspired by Matthew chapter 5, verse 41, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. So today, I'm forced by Reverend Chris. No, Reverend Chris didn't force me. Reverend Chris, he foresightedly <laughs> rostered me in this preaching schedule, and then I'm so blessed to this, have this opportunity to go extra. Okay, so thank you. 
Reverend Chris, for this opportunity. But of course, not by my strength, nor by my might, but by the Spirit of God. Amen? So let us look to God and His Spirit and let us pray. Father Lord, we want to thank you. We want to thank you for Lord, you are the giver of life. You are the compassionate giver of life. And Lord, we pray that Lord, today, you will fill your children with your spirit. And Lord, open our hearts to receive your beautiful words, the lamb to our feet, Lord. And pray that Lord, your words will be transforming, transform our life into the likeness of Christ. And may the words of your servant and the meditation of your children be acceptable and delightful in your sight our rock, our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, before I go into extra, I think uh, the topic extra, uh, I'm, let me share with you an illustration. And I think probably some of you have heard this illustration before, so I made some adjustment to it, adaptations to it, so that it can better suit local taste. Well, long, long time ago, in a far, far away place, there lives a benevolent, a loving ruler, a king. And in this country, there is a, an area where there are many people who are hungry, who are lonely, and who are suffering. Well, the king knows of this condition, and his heart is for them. So he gathered a group of people and tell them, hey, I want you to make a difference in the area. Bring food to the hungry, bring company to the lonely, and bring them out of their suffering. So this group of people, commission and purpose, went there and started a community center. You all know what's community center? You know the place we play basketball, read newspaper, and community center. And uh, they went knocking on doors and to call these people to the community centre, telling them, hey, come to our community centre. There will be food, there will be friends, there will be chit-chats. Come and join us. And people came. And the membership grew because, will be, because they are not hungry, they are not lonely, and many uh, was being delivered out of their suffering because of this beautiful community centre. As time passes, many things were added into this community centre. Things improve. Now there's better reception, there's better canteen, there's beautiful clean toilets. It's beautiful. And the membership continued to grow. Until one fine day, things grow until it's beyond our imagination. Now this community centre has high tilao because the member think that we should have high tilao. All right? Now, this, this, this community center has a Sengxiong supermarket, three-story high, finest, all right? Selling produce from all over the world. And then this place has Tio Heng Karaoke, where people can sing karaoke and enjoy. And then there's a big golf course in this community center. And guess what? The place decides to change its name from community center to country club. Now it becomes a country club. And people around in this area, they find it hard to enter because they feel out of place. They felt irrelevant. And members of this country club stopped knocking on doors and inviting people over. So one fine day, a group of people uh, find it frustrating because they felt this place has lost its sense of meaning and purpose. So in an AGM, annual general meeting, uh, a meeting that we all love, all right? Uh, AGM, this group of people, they, they actually shared to the crowd, hey guys, I think we have lost our meaning and purpose. Let us go back to why we came here for. But the majority of the members decides to veto against them, all right? And says, no, we want our high tilao. In fact, I want high tilao to be bigger, all right? And this group of people left disappointed. Yet at the same time, they were energized to start another community center. So, so this place now got one country club and one community center. But as time passes, this community center became a country club. And then a group of people went to start another community center and becomes a country club. Now this place becomes a tourism spot because this is an area famous for country clubs. And still, there are many people who are hungry, lonely, and suffering. This is a very sad story. And you may think this country, this fictional country, um, is not Singapore. But truth be told, I'm afraid 
Singapore is likewise. Let me show you two figures, 11.1% and 0.6%. As a modern man myself, I consulted ChatGBT. All right? I consulted ChatGPT. I've moved beyond Google. Now I'm into ChatGPT. All right? So I consulted ChatGPT. Hey, ChatGPT, can you please tell me? I asked ChatGPT, ChatGPT two questions. The first question, hey, ChatGPT, can you please tell me what is the percentage increase in the number of churches in Singapore from 2010 to 2020? And ChatGPT respond by saying, well, 11.1%. Well, there's a lot of, lot of church, man. It's like, on average, if I can remember correctly, it's, if you divide the number of church by the MRT stops, uh, it's about six to eight churches in between two MRT stops. That's a lot. That's a lot of churches in Singapore. And I was like, wow, means our reach is, is wider, means we can be more effective in bringing the gospel to our, to our society and transforming life, blessings life. But then again, I asked the second question to ChatGPT. I said, hey, bro, hey, sis, because you're genderless, okay? Uh, ChatGPT, can you please tell me the percentage increase in the number of Singaporeans from 2010 to 2020, number of Singaporeans that, be that became Christian, all right? The number of Singaporeans that became Christian, the percentage increase, and the number is 0.6%. The number of Singaporeans becoming Christian in that 10 years is 0.6%. I would have thought 11.1%, the number of church increased so much. We have wider reach. We should be more effective. We should be more vocal. We should be louder. We cannot be quiet about the gospel. Many lives would have heard about the gospel and their lives be changed and transformed. Many hungry will be fed. Many lonely will, will be accompanied. And many who are suffered will be brought out of their suffering. But no, apparently 0.6% as compared to the increase in the number of church. Something must be amiss. Something must be not right. And today, I think God wants to challenge all of us to not be a church that wants Hai Ti Lao, <laughs> but a church that wants to be Christ-like in our neighbourhood, in our society, and in our country. Of course, to be Christ-like, there's many aspects, and today I want to touch on being extraordinarily. Well, when we hear the word extra, normally we'll feel uncomfortable, correct? Especially when you're serving in the army. When I was serving in the army, when I hear the word extra, I don't just hear, I gonna, I gonna extra, all right? <laughs> Means I will have to give up my weekends with my ex-girlfriend, all right? To, you know, party and all, just because I gonna extra. And when you are, if you are working, you have a working adult, you go office, and then you work, 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 and it's 5 p.m., you can hear the beautiful sound of dismissal. And then suddenly, this sound is not what you hear. Instead, you hear the footstep of your manager coming to you. Hey, bro, hey, sis, I got some extra work for you. Wow. You'll be smiling at your manager, but the moment he turns away, your smile may be transformed to curses and swearing. I want to go home, but now you give me extra work and I have to work extra time. Extra is not something that we are comfortable with, especially you are standing on your weighing scale. Imagine standing on weighing scale and the things show you extra, extra, extra. Wow, that's, that's not good. That's uncomfortable. We don't like the word extra normally. Generally, we don't like, we are uncomfortable with the word extra. Well, uh, this year, I, 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 there's this morning prayer. And after morning prayer, uh, I thought, okay, maybe I should have breakfast at Yakun, right? just beside uh, our church. And then Reverend Chris from Level 3, I'm at Level 1, okay? He looked down at me. He said, hey, very kai, do you want to go jogging? And I was thinking, okay, la, since I'm going to gym after my breakfast, I mean, for a while later today, so I might as well uh, go and exercise. I asked him, how far? He said, not too far, la, four kilometers. I said, like, okay, four kilometers is manageable. Okay, it's manageable. I said, oh, okay. Then uh, Reverend Chris, we all changed our attire. And Reverend Aaron joined us. And then we ran. We ran and ran and ran and we ran 10 kilometers. <laughs> because Reverend Aaron refused to use GPS. And we ran Botanical Garden for three rounds. <laughs> if Reverend Chris, I mean, in the first place, if you tell me that I have to run extra, I would not have joined him. I went yakun and order extra. 
Okay, we are uncomfortable with the word extra. But today, I think God challenged us to be extra in a Christ-like manner. Well, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 41, it says, If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Well, in this context, when Jesus taught this teaching, what he meant is that in that, in that culture, in that Romanized culture, is that any military man then, okay, man of power, he can order any commoners or peasant to walk, to take their possession and walk a mile. Just to flex, just to showcase his power and authority. To how I mean in a Hokkien way, in a manner, all right? So anyone, any military man can do it. And if you were the recipient of such unjust unfairness, you probably retaliate by saying, no, I will not walk. I'll complain, all right? But Jesus taught his disciples to not just walk one mile, but to respond by walking with them two miles. Such radical teaching. And if you read the verses before and after, the verses before are familiar verses that we know. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but no. Whoever slap you on the right, turn your face and let him slap on the left. Wow. And then if anyone sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And the verse after this, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Well, all these teachings are very, very radical. Very radical. But I think they, all of them sing the same tune, which is being extra, being very, very extra. In fact, to the extent that you lose your rights, you forsake your rights. Well, rights today are being advocated, which is very good. I mean, woke culture, one thing about woke culture is that there's an emphasis on human rights. I think rights is good. I'm not trying to say we don't need rights. Rights is no good. Rights is important. Our employee needs to know our rights. Our employer needs to know their rights. Our student needs to know their rights. The teachers need to know their rights. Rights is helpful because it set up certain perimeter boundaries so that people in the society can better associate with one another and protect themselves. But the problem with woke culture is that, yes, it emphasizes human rights, but at the same time, it elevates individualism, self-centeredness, to the extent that my rights is above everything. So if today Jesus is here in this world, at this time, teaching this message, I can quite surely tell you he will be cancelled. Because instead of saying, protect your rights, you know, you need to elevate your rights. He says, give up your rights. Give up your rights, not enough, but go extra. One mile, not enough, two miles. Jesus taught such radical messages because he is a compassionate Lord and Saviour. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 to 37, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Shall we read together the last two lines? The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Let me point all of us to the word compassion. I think today God wants to challenge us with this word, compassion. I think we need to reflect our life is our life a life of compassion? But before we reflect, we need to understand what is compassion. We need to define what is compassion. Let me define compassion for you via the means of using word origin. So compassion in Greek, the word is splachnizomai. All right, splachnizomai. And uh, you can, I mean, it, it don't mean anything. It's just, it seems, if you don't know Greek word alphabets, it's just gibberish. All right, splash knees on my. What does it mean? Let me use this picture or this food item to let you understand in Greek culture what it means about compassion, and that is zhu zha tang, pig organ soup. Wow, I love pig organ soup. I tell you, I can order extra definitely. Tiong Bahru one, Jalan Besar one. Woo, shook with the chili. Why am I showing this? Organs. Well, splash knees on my. The word, in fact, the word origin from splashnizo, my splashna, the word splashna means organs. Friends, means compassion must stem from 
our within, our inside, from our organs. Compassion is not superficial, it's not formality, it's not for the sake of doing, it's not scratching the surface, it's from our inside that we show compassion, that we give compassion. I hope that after today, every time you eat zu zha tang, a pig organ soup, every time you eat kuei chap, every time you eat faux grass, you remember to have compassion. Amen? Okay, don't after that everyone go and eat a pig organ soup. I wait long queue. Okay? Yeah, so this is the Greek word origin. Let me bring you to the English word origin or the Latin word origin since English is from Latin, Latin, okay? So compassion in Latin is compati. Compati. Uh, it's made up of two parts, all right? Com and passion. Basically, com means putting together. Okay, that's an element of togetherness. So company, together, all right? Compute, bringing the data together, all right? So com means coming together, bringing together. Well, passion here, I think we need to define properly because today, today's media tells us a very different story of what is passion. If passion is Korean drama, I'm sorry, that's not the definition. I mean, there's a famous movie, The Passion of Christ. If The Passion of Christ, that movie, is filmed in a way of the Korean drama, I don't think I can watch to the end because everyone will be opa, opa, umni, umni. All right? Sarang heyo. It'll be strange. All right, but passion of Christ. What is passion? Passion means suffering. Suffering. So the passion of Christ means the suffering of Christ. So by putting the two parts together, calm and passion, it simply means to suffer together. To suffer together. And if we bring the Greek meaning we, together with the English meaning, this is the beautiful definition that I want to place in your heart about compassion. Compassion is the inner conviction to share in the suffering of others. Even if it means that you need to give up your rights, even if it means you need to give up your comfort, your convenience, the inner conviction to share in the suffering of others. Friends, I think we are very blessed people. Christians are very, very blessed people because we know who is God and our God is compassionate. Amen? He is compassionate and we are the beneficiary recipients of God's compassion. And I think God's compassion, I think, is beautifully demonstrated, illustrated in the parable of the prodigal son. Well, in Luke chapter 15, verse 20, it says, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Friends, the son stayed with the pigs, eat what the pigs eat, must be smelly, must be dirty, must be unclean. And in fact, he betrayed his father by asking for inheritance and left him. And he came back. The father, an honorable figure, you know, well-dressed, clean, smart-looking, he has all the rights to wait for the son to come back, bathe, you know, say sorry and whatever. But he didn't. In fact, he ran. He ran to the dirty son. He ran to the unclean son out of compassion to hug him, to kiss him. This is our God. We were that son. We were unclean. We were wayward. But God came. God ran to us and embraced us because our God is a compassionate God. But the thing is, I realize that we love, we enjoy being the recipient, beneficiary of God's compassion. But sometimes we hesitate to be the giver of compassion. Sometimes we behave like the elder son. Why, 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 why doing this guy? Is he deserving of my compassion? Is he deserving of me forsaking my rights? Is he deserving of me going an extra mile for this person? The elder sons, he, he cannot understand why the father behaved that way. And he was angry. And I think he has all the rights to be angry. 
this brother of mine, good for nothing, now come back, why should we treat him like in, in such fashion, chew him a banquet? What the, what, what happening? What's happening? Well, the father is a compassionate father. He's compassionate to the younger son and he's compassionate to the elder son as well. So he went to the elder son and explained to him his heart, hoping that the elder brother, his heart, will be changed and be attuned to the heart of the compassionate father. So today I think, friends, we need, if you are currently like the elder brother, God wants our hearts to be attuned to his, his compassionate heart. I mean, God's compassion is not just compassion. He's extra compassion. God has so much compassion that he sent his son to be crucified for all of us. He don't need to, and we are not worthy. But he went extra to send his son to die for our sins on the cross and be resurrected for our well-being. And we who receive this gospel, this grace and mercy, we ought to be transformed to be like Christ. Our Lord and Saviour, He is a compassionate Lord and Saviour. When He saw the crowds, He had compassion on them. Before these verses, Jesus was doing many miracles. He was performing many miracles, healing people, delivering people, even bringing a girl up from death to life. Doing so many miracles. But He see the crowd. In this crowd, He sees the hungry he sees the lonely, he sees the sick, he sees the suffering. And he said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Sometimes when we, I mean, church like to use this line, huh? the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Especially when we have an outreach program coming up. Hey guys, are you ready? The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So join us, come volunteer. It's a way to rara for manpower, huh? this, this line, all right? And... It seems like the harvest is very glorious, very golden, beaming, all right? And if this, is not, if this picture is not glorious enough, maybe Singaporeans will find this better. <laughs> what? Harvest is plentiful! A whole tree of Mao San Wang, all right? Black thorn, Lao Su, old tree, all right? Come, come, workers, come. I don't think the workers are few. Lah. I think there will be many workers already, <laughs> all right? Wearing helmets, waiting for the durian to come now. But no, when Jesus says the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few, I believe he carries that sentiment of urgency and also the sentiment of lamentation that ah, there are still hungry people, lonely people, sick people, suffering people. The harvest is really plentiful. But where are the workers with me? Well, let me show you four pictures. The bottom left, uh, it's a picture of the uh, Israel war, all right? And there are many people, so just today this news, uh, a bombing hit a, a school in Gaza and many were killed. And many people are suffering, losing their loved ones, hungry, lonely and suffering. I believe if Jesus is there, he will have said the same thing. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Well, don't get me wrong that everyone should leave our seat right now, you know, get our tickets and fly to Israel. No, but are we able to forsake our right to, uh, our, right to our time to pray for them, to intercede for them? Well, the bottom right photo is me, obviously, with a Santa Claus hat. All right, this happens in Nepal. Nepal is a beautiful place. This is Nepal Dading. So we went to Nepal for a mission trip and we planned a Christmas children program for them. And when we went there, we reached there, the church is empty. And we thought, ah, yeah, the children, probably no one cares. Lah. The Christianity probably is not um, popular. Uh, people here may not be hungry you know, for God and, and, and all. So we went out of the church building and we went jalan-jalan, walk around for five minutes, ten minutes, and we went back. Then the whole room... It's filled with children. The whole room is filled with children. And when we say Jesus, they will exclaim excitedly, Jesus! They're hungry for God. They're hungry for the gospel. And also, we had the opportunity to bless them uh, physically, financially, materially, and also spiritually. 
And, if I, and I believe that if Jesus is in that room, he will have said the same thing. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers were few. There's only five of us and a few church leaders to 300 children in that room and outside. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Well, if you look at the top right picture, it's a nursing, it's a picture of a nursing home, St. Andrew Nursing Home. But when I was studying in Trinity Theological College, there is a module that I need to attend, a class that I need to attend. The class, the title of the module is Clinical Pastoral Education. So there is a need for me to visit wards, hospital wards, all right, and visit the patient, talk to them, befriend them, and also have chapel time with them. So during one chapel time, uh, an elderly man was willed into the chapel. He has his leg amputated because of diabetes. So I sat beside him after the chapel and I talked to him. And he shared with me his life and he told me that he's, he feels that he's unwanted, he's unloved. His family don't want him anymore, never visit him. And he don't find himself worthy of living. And my heart aches for him. My heart grieves for him. And I believe if Jesus is beside me, having that conversation with him, Jesus will have said the same thing. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. But the last photo on the top left is just a normal coffee shop, Kopitiam. People were eating their bachok mee, wonton noodle, zi cha, whatever. All right, having a good time smiling. But we never know. Behind all these smiles, behind all this conversation, what are they going through? They may be struggling financially, emotionally, materially, spiritually. I believe if Jesus is in the coffee shop, stirring his coffee, he will probably have said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. I think our Lord is a compassionate God and all he wants is to be with those who are suffering. John chapter 1 says, the word became flesh and dwell among us. Jesus wants to dwell among the lonely, the hungry, the sick, and the suffering. And he wants to do it through all of us. Our God is a compassionate God. That's why Jesus taught the disciples, what you do among the least of them, you are doing unto me. Because our God is compassion for them. And he wants us to share in that extra compassion. So today, I preach on being extraordinarily. But of course, extra may mean many things. Extra bonus, extra grace, extra generosity. Today, I want to point everyone to extra compassionate ordinary. Being extra compassionate ordinary. Well, being extra compassionate ordinary is different from being extraordinarily compassionate. Wait, 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 very confusing. Hear me out again. The difference between being extra compassionate ordinarily and being extraordinarily compassionate is different. And why is it different? Because if you are compassionate extraordinarily, it means it's out of your norm. It's out of your norm that you perform something compassionately. But Jesus, his compassion, all right, is extra. And it's not momentarily, it's not temporary. In fact, it's every day of his life, Jesus. He's so compassionate every day of his life, healing people, delivering people, praying for people, teaching people, all the way to the cross. Never once in his life is less compassionate. He is compassionate all the way, not momentarily, not extraordinarily, but ordinarily, extra compassionately. So today, I want to challenge all of us to live a life like Christ, to be extra compassionate ordinarily. And you may be thinking, can I be extra compassionate ordinarily? Friends, I must tell you, this is a wrong question to think about because it's not about can or cannot. It's about want to or not. Well, I've, I'm married for five years, uh, I, I, five plus years, all right? And um, I've gained 10 kilograms from, from the day that I was married. Okay, 10 kilograms. And my wife, uh, many times she will look at me and say, hey, 
do you want to lose some weight? And I will respond to her. Um, I can if I want to, you know. Then she will respond in frustration. I believe you can, but the problem is you don't want. And I think same goes for us when we want to be extra compassionate. It's not about can or cannot. It's about want to or not. Seriously, can you take leave to be a blessing on a mission trip? You can, but do you want to or not? Can you buy a drink for a stranger in a coffee shop and sit beside him and share lives? Well, you can. It'll be awkward, but you can. It's about whether you want to or not. Can you text a cellmate who shared with you uh, having a difficult week? Can you text a friend, text him or her, and share a prayer with him or her? Can you? Well, it takes some time, but you can. But it's whether you want to or not. So being extra compassionate ordinarily is not about can or cannot. The hurdle that we must jump across is about whether we want or not. We want to or not. There's this encounter with God that I find it so vivid, so convicting that I will not forget until my death on this earth. Well, I had uh, my baby. My baby, uh, according to Chinese custom, we need to celebrate her 100 day, year, 100 day old. All right? uh, we, need to, we, need to throw, we need to throw a party, a baby shower, and invite our friends. So it's evening. The program is evening. My in-laws were early. My in-laws, after lunch, they come already. I also don't know how to entertain them. I also, <laughs> I'm not prepared. They come too early. And then my friends start coming. They come early, they come on time. But my parents, they were late. I'm so angry. I was so very angry with them. I think that this kind of anger is... I mean, it's not, I mean I'm, 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 I'm right to be angry. These are my parents, the, pa- the, the grandparents of my child, I mean, if my friend late, I can forgive, but I can understand, but I can still accept it. But my parents, they are late. 30 minutes, an hour, where were they? I'm so angry, wrestling with, with my opinion and my thoughts. But when the leaf door opens and they walk out of the leaf, I'm so thankful that the Spirit of God, the compassionate Spirit of God convicts my heart. I saw their body, I saw them frail, walking slowly, coming out of the leaf, I cannot be angry. I cannot be angry. Ang- anger left me. Frustration left me. But what fills my heart is the compassion of God. I tell them, Pa, me, please take a seat. Come, come take a seat. Come take a seat. Have you, I, I believe you haven't eaten, right? Let me take some food for you. Pa, I know your teeth is not good. I, let me choose something that's softer for you to eat. And hey, you all don't need to walk to the baby because it's very squeezy. I will bring the baby to you. I was convicted by the spirit of our compassionate God to act extra compassionately to them. And I'm thankful that I'm able to do so. Can I do it? Can. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for allowing me to want to do that. And because of this episode, I'm convinced, very convinced and convicted that Christ-likeness is as such. And not just my parents. Now, to my family, other family members, to my friends, to any strangers, I pray, Spirit, not by my mind, not by my strength, but by your Spirit, help me to live like Christ, to be extra compassionate, ordinarily, not just momentarily. And today, I want to invite you for your response. I think today is not a day where you listen to a sermon and you feel good. Also, it's not about going out and do good. I think it's about being good. And being good is about being Christ-like, transformed into the likeness of Christ. And when I talk about likeness of Christ, it means to be extra compassionate ordinarily. I want to invite you to respond. And I think raising our hand is too normal. Let us be extra. I want you to stand up. On the count of three, if you are convinced and convicted that God, thank you for being compassionate. I want to be like Christ. I want to be extra compassionate, ordinary in my life. On the count of three, I want you to stand up. 
I want you to stand up. On a one, two, and three. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you for being compassionate in our life. Thank you for spirit, filling us with your spirit. I want to pray for all of you. Father Lord, we thank you for being our compassionate God. In fact, extra compassionate, Lord, that you send your son to die on the cross for us, despite us being wayward, despite us being sinful, but because, Lord, your compassion, your son died and rose for our sake, for our well-being. We thank you, Lord. And we pray the gospel of Christ to transform our life so that, Lord, our hearts may not be like the elder brother, but be akin, alike to the heart of yours, Lord, to be extra compassionate wherever we are because, Lord, your spirit, your compassionate spirit resides in our very being. So help us, Lord, when there are hurdles to overcome, to go across. Help us, Lord, to live like Christ. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. Empower us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right now, we're going to sing this song. And I think the lyrics is very beautiful. It talks about God's compassion and how much we need God's grace and mercy via His compassion. And also, we need to be like Christ, to care like Christ. I mean, if being like Christ is not a good reason enough for you, I cannot think of a better reason. So I pray that this song, as we sing, the Holy Spirit to convict our hearts, to turn our life Christ's word, God word. Lord, we need your grace and mercy. We need to pray like never before. We need the power of your Holy Spirit to open heaven's door. Spirit, touch your church. Father God, we want to thank you for your word today. Lord, we want to pray, God, that you will empower us. Would you empower us, give us a conviction from deep within, deep within our organs, deep within ourselves, Lord. We want to pray for that transformation, for that desire to stem right from the inside to want to just follow you all the way and not be afraid to doing anything extra. Actually, many of these things that are extra are not even extra. These are the things that you do all the time. So Lord, we pray, God, that you'll give us that strength and the grace to do the things that you have put in our hearts to do. So we commit all these into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.